Turf management and cultural landscapes. Today, Charlie Pepper from the Olmsted Center will define cultural landscapes and the history of turf grass. I want to talk about setting expectations and objectives for managing turf grass with, in this particular case, the overlay of managing cultural landscapes. And an important part of uh, considering what our objectives are, not only for the entire landscape, but for the turf as well, is how do we want to represent uh, these landscapes to reflect, in large part, the historic character that was there during the preservation period that we've identified for the particular site. So let's just start right in. What I want to do is define, just so we're all on the same page, what a cultural landscape is, explore a brief overview of turf grass history, consider how historic preservation research, analysis, and planning can help guide turf grass management in cultural landscapes, and look at a few examples of turf management uh, that is currently occurring in some of our uh, more important cultural landscapes across the country. So, cultural landscape. Now, I use the uh, United Nations uh, UNESCO description because it's much shorter than what we use in the National Park Service. And a cultural landscape is defined by the United Nations a geographic area that represents interaction between humankind and the environment. So a pretty basic uh, description of uh, those landscapes where there is some human involvement. And in the National Park Service, we really look at four different criteria or reasons why uh, we determine cultural landscapes as having significance or importance. First, because a property might have an association with people significant to our nation's history. Uh, and the example on the screen is Theodore Roosevelt's uh, estate on Long Island, New York, known as Sagamore Hill, uh, or the Summer White House during his presidency, uh, where he lived and worked uh, for a major portion of, of his life. Second reason is an association with events significant to our nation's history. And the example is Ellis Island. Uh, Ellis Island serving as one of the principal immigration stations for the country uh, where millions of uh, immigrants pass through. Third, we look at uh, those properties that have distinctive characteristics of a type, period, or method of construction, or that represent the work of a master, or possess high artistic value. And oftentimes this is thought of uh, in, in regards to historic structures. But it applies to landscapes as well. This is, a, this is Central Park in New York, uh, not a national park as we all know, but uh, the work of a master, Frederick Law Olmsted, the father of American landscape architecture, designed and oversaw uh, the construction of, of this park. And lastly, we look at properties that have yielded or are likely to yield information important to our prehistory or history. This is the African burial ground in Manhattan that uh, was discovered uh, during the expansion of the adjacent GSA building. And uh, it dates back to the 17th century. Uh, and no one knew it was there, even though it's in downtown Manhattan. So those are the four types of properties and the reasons why we consider them to be important. And then as we begin to think about how do we manage those properties, we need to, we begin to look at uh, what we're caring for and when it may have uh, entered into the property historically. I thought it might be useful for us as a class to kind of think about the history of turf grass and when turf grass uh, began to be managed in the United States and some of the different management techniques that were used. So, up until 1830, uh, there wasn't a lot going on in turf grass management in the United States. If you look at its early history, uh, the first 
published documentation of using grass for lawns dates to about the 12th century. So we know that the use of, of grasses for lawn purposes is, is pretty old. In 16th century Europe, lawn referred to open space in the woods, and it became fashionable amongst aristocrats as a closely mowed landscape in the 17th and 18th century. And lastly, it was closely scythed or grazed sweeps of short grass that provided views to and from, in this country, 18th century estates for some of uh, more prominent citizens, such as uh, George Washington at Mount Vernon uh, and uh, Thomas Jefferson at Monticello. So this is uh, artwork showing some of that uh, low grazed turf area or grass areas. This is uh, Versailles in France and in 1661 there was a reference in Versailles uh, records of an area called tapis vert, which means green carpet, and uh, there are records of these lawns being present at Versailles uh, during that period of time. Here in the United States, as I mentioned, uh, the home of George Washington, Mount Vernon in Virginia, the lawns uh, to the front of the home were clearly documented in some of the early uh, records of the property. This is a painting done in the late 18th century, so the late 1700s. And you can see uh, the clear resemblance between the picture and the photograph. Uh, at Monticello, Thomas Jefferson's home, uh, he actually drew plans uh, for the property uh, in the 18th century and called out for a an area of lawn or closely mowed grass to the front of the home. Right there is uh, Monticello, the house, the mansion. And today, that lawn is still in existence and maintained as specified by Thomas Jefferson. As we move forward in turf grass history, there was sort of a big expansion period from the 1830s to 1945 when lawns became much more popular and commonplace throughout the United States. And some key periods during that time were in 1830, the first lawnmower patent was actually provided, and manufacturing of that lawnmower began in 1832. It was the budding lawnmower, the first mechanized lawnmower powered by steam. It was in the 1890s, and then the first gasoline-powered mower was in 1919. So you can see, well, you know, this equipment started to become more available, and with more availability of equipment for folks other than presidents of the United States, uh, more lawns were established and maintained. Uh, an 1840 publication called The Young Gardener's Assistant referred to lawns as frequently mowed and rolled to give a neat and carpet-like appearance. And by the late 19th century, grazing animals on lawns was no longer socially acceptable. People now had lawn mowers available and they were thinking, hey, why would I want livestock out on my front lawn? Um, the turf species that, were, that are commonly used today were all documented in New York by 1908. So there's clear record uh, by Cornell University that those species existed in the state at that time. And then by the mid to late 19th century, turf was being commonly used in American public parks. And one example of that is Prospect Park uh, in Brooklyn, New York. Again, a, a large city park designed by Frederick Law Olmsted in uh, the 1860s, 1870s. Then we move from 1945 to today, and here's where we really see sort of the industrialization and commercialization of lawn care in the United States. We really see an explosion of science and industry sort of working its way into, into lawn care. 
Uh, numerous turf grass research programs were established at universities in the United States during this period. Penn State, for example, started their turf grass uh, program, their science, science program in 1929, uh, as an example. Advanced research and development of turf management, science, engineering, and practice moved forward rapidly uh, over the period of the last 80 years. In post-World War II, uh, a new residential suburban home with a manicured front lawn became the American dream. And this very interesting quote that I found, uh, in such a world of landscape uniformity, a yard full of crabgrass, which caused one to stand out from their neighbors, was the outdoor equivalent to bad breath. And uh, that's absolutely true. During that period of time, you know, this is where everyone was looking for that, you know, perfect, that white house lawn uh, out in front of their home. Development application of pesticides for turf grass management skyrocketed, and all aspects of turf, turf grass management as a commercial industry became established and commonplace. Some interesting examples of, of this time period are, you know, the readily available equipment to homeowners for lawn care. Ultimately, how do we use this information? Well, you know, we can kind of, we can render all that information down to some, into some key points about different periods of time and then begin to apply those key points to at least setting some what I call benchmarks for determining what's appropriate historic authenticity in how we care for our lawns based on the historic periods that we're trying to reflect at our historic properties. So, for example, uh, pre-1830, so if uh, you're working at a historic site that uh, uh, has a historic period of before 1830, uh, your lawns, lawns were virtually non-existent outside of prominent estates, and those that were existing were either scythed or grazed by livestock. So if you're maintaining a Class A White House style lawn in a uh, pre-1830 cultural landscape, you're probably not reflecting the authentic character of that site. Uh, between 1830 and 1945, lawns became more commonplace, so they started to enter into these properties. But they were probably more roughly mown with a broad diversity of turf species uh, and weeds in their composition. And from 1945 to today, Turf grasses became highly manicured, especially later in the period, uh, evenly clipped with low weed populations. So again, these are, these are benchmarks. They're not site specific, but they can begin to you know, provide you with some framework to at least make uh, decisions about uh, how you might want to think about managing your lawn. And uh, it can begin to inform uh, and guide some of that initial research documentation and planning that you do for, uh, in caring for a historic property. 